All right, everybody, I'm here with Eric Allen. If you don't know who Eric Allen is, you clearly are not watching a lot of Murdoch YouTube videos, but I looked into our channel analytics and Eric Allen's channel is the channel with the highest amount of crossovers with our viewers and subscribers. So I know that a lot of you guys are familiar with his work. Eric has done great work um, on Murdoch, mini documentary style videos. And I'm here to talk with him about those today and where he sees the case going and kind of how he got into shooting these videos and, and the wild ride that it's been since then. So I'll open it up to you. Yeah. Well, first off, thank you for having me. Of course. Um, uh, when, uh, when you reached out about the interview, I was like, oh, of course. I'm really excited about this. Um, I uh, got started with the case, actually, and I don't even think I've told Mandy this. Uh, me and Mandy have talked a few times about the case, and we've, we've met in person, and uh, me and David text and stuff like that. But... Um, Obviously, being in Beaufort, South Carolina, I heard about the boating accident with Mallory, and um, that really did kind of shake the whole town. And um, after that, the murder of Paul and Maggie Murdoch, I still remember my roommate getting home one day and, and being like, hey, did you hear what happened to Paul Murdoch, the, the kid with the boat, that, with the accident you know, a couple years ago? And I was like, no. He told me about it. And then I remember maybe a month after that, I was scrolling on Facebook, and a friend of mine had posted a link to Mandy's podcast. And I was like, "Oh, interesting! There's a podcast on this. I'll, you know, I'll have to check it out. I'm here. I'm interested in this story." And I think it was maybe like the third or fourth episode. Um, so it might have been a little bit more than a than a month after. But and so I listened to it. And I was like, "This is great, and this story is great, um, but it's missing visuals." Like. I can picture a lot of the stuff in my Something head. Something that I was thinking as well, by the way. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, and so I thought to myself, like, I could dive into this story and as a local, get visuals of all of these places. And it would be a fun side project for me. And it would be uh, really in a different, me and Mandy are in different spaces, really in the way that we tell this story. Um, obviously, she's incredible at the investigative side of it. And then she does really, really deep dives, long form, and uh, and it's it's wonderful. And then you know the content that I produce is a little bit different, but I didn't really have any expectations for where it might go. I was shooting uh, high end real estate photography and videography. That was my job, and uh, mostly in Hilton Head, South Carolina, and Charleston, South Carolina. And so I always like doing things on the side for fun that would further my career or something that I'm passionate about. So I figured in my spare time, let me make a little documentary about this story and uh, it'll help me become a better videographer, a better storytelling. Um, I mean, you know that, that storytelling in any type of videography sense is important. Um, even when you're selling a house, storytelling is important. And painting a picture of what it would be like if the customer bought the house. So um, I spent, I want to say like three months on that first episode almost. And uh, ended up doing way more than I initially thought I would do. And really just kind of like diving in and it, it got a little out of control. But I made the first episode and uh, I was really proud of it. And I remember before I posted it, there was a little part of me that was like, this, this might actually like go somewhere. Like, who knows? You know, like it might get a hundred views. And if it does, that's fine. I enjoyed the process of making it, but what if it gets more than a hundred views? That, <laughs> that could be really cool. And so, um, I also remember one of the things that I really struggled with, and I, I still struggle with, with this to this day. Um, and, and I, I hope I do forever, um, because I think it, uh, shapes how I make these videos, but the idea and concept of um, tragedy as a form of entertainment uh, almost made me not even put out that first episode. Um, I think especially with it being, um, you know, with the Beach family being in my hometown, um, and I didn't personally know any of them, um, well, they're in Hampton, but they're, you know, they're in Beaufort all the time. But I, I know people that know them. And so it's my community. These are my people. And you're not Nancy Grace parachuting in for a 60 second spot between commercial breaks. Exactly. 
Exactly. Uh, and there's a disconnect for Nancy Grace that I don't have. Um, and so I almost didn't put it out because I, I felt uncomfortable with it. And there was a little part of me that was like, yeah. And so um, I did end up deciding to put it out. And uh, obviously I was real careful with the whole subject in my episode. And I really wanted the audience to connect with the fact that these are real people um, that lost their lives, that have family that love them. And this isn't just a story, a movie. This is, uh, this, this is real life. And so um, I remember it was Saturday, whatever day the Alec Murdoch staged his shooting. I forget the exact date. Um, my mind's full of dates. But that, that very morning, I woke up and I, the day before, had finished my first episode. <laughs> And so that morning, I spent a couple hours putting together like a 60-second trailer for it. Mm -hmm. And I posted that to YouTube and uh, posted it to like my social medias and stuff. And I was really excited to see it like getting like a couple hundred views and stuff. Right. And I was like, oh, this is crazy. Like this, this might, you know, um, my standards were, were pretty low for what was awesome <laughs> at, right. that, at that point. And uh, then I remember um, hearing the news of the shooting, hearing that break. And immediately I drove home, grabbed my drone <laughs> and drove to the scene and got footage. And uh, so with that being like a big part of the story, um, breaking, it was the perfect time to post my first episode because interest in the case just spiked again. And so uh, I posted that first episode. There was a lot of interest in the case at the time. And I really just got lucky with the timing of it all. Um, I got really, really lucky. And um, I remember it might have even been that Sunday the next day or maybe that Monday. But I remember being stressed out because things were going so well. And it's just weird when like thousands of people are, are watching your stuff. And, and for context, yeah. your first video right now is sitting at right under a million views. Yeah. And that's a number of views that somebody might take five, ten years to build a channel yeah. to the point where it gets that many views. Yeah. So to come out of the gates ripping almost a million views is absurd. <laughs> it, it really is. It's absurd. And, and yeah, for even more context, one of the reasons I decided to you know, kind of try out the YouTube thing is one of my best friends um, is a Twitch streamer, YouTuber. Uh, he's a gamer. And so um, it's funny because he, I'll sit down and talk with him and complain about how a video is doing or how my analytics or something. He's like, dude, Eric, shut up. Hmm. He's like, you have no right to complain. <laughs> yeah. He's like, he's like, dude, you have no right to complain. Like it's uh, his, his journey has been very different from mine. It's been a, a, a very slow and steady growth. And it's been great too. I mean, he just hit over a hundred thousand subscribers. He makes good money on Twitch and he's been full time for about a year and a half now. So he's doing awesome things too, but his journey has been just like a slow, steady grind up. And so, um, and so, yeah, you're right. The, the context of that is just wild with, with kind of what my channel did. But um, so the next few days, I was really just stressing out. The, the concept of uh, thousands and thousands of people uh, watching your stuff can just freak you out sometimes. So I had my first episode going, and um, I had that footage of the Alec Murdoch crime scene. And I didn't know what I was doing. So part of me was like, is this even legal that I have <laughs> this footage? Am I allowed to have this? And so um, I remember I, I forget what medium I did it on, whether I think it was a Facebook message, but I friend requested Mandy on Facebook. And I, cause I was like, she'll know what to do. <laughs> right. And I sent her a message and I was like, hey Mandy, uh, I got some footage of the Alec Murdoch crime scene and I don't even know if it's legal. <laughs> like, uh, do you mind if, if we hop on a phone call or something? And she didn't even know who I was. I don't think she had seen any of my stuff at the time. And she was gracious enough to be like, yeah, here's my phone number. Give me a call. Um, which I appreciated so much. And so I hopped on the phone with her and she was like, yeah, it's, it's all legal. You're like, it's, it's public domain. You're allowed to film whatever, uh, you know, like go ahead and post it. Like do what you need to do. And, uh, and she didn't ask anything from me. She wasn't doing it to try to get footage. 
she really was just like, I, I just want to help this guy out. Here's my phone number. Give me a call. So that meant so much to me. So um, at that point, I remember things got kind of crazy because I had spent three months working on this first episode. And now everyone's asking, where's episode two? And I'm like, episode two doesn't exist. Right. It's, it's not there. I haven't even started researching for episode two. I don't have a direction. I don't have... Uh, it, you started on a whim and then got yeah. really into it and finally finished it. And you're yeah. like, all right, let me let this out. Yeah. And then it blows up. Yeah. It got out of control. It got out of hand. <laughs> and, and everyone's ready for episode two. So um, it, it's interesting. I think a lot of times people see you know, like success stories like this, channels blowing up and stuff like that. And they're just like, man, it must be all fun and games. What a crazy, awesome thing. And it was. I'm very grateful for it. It was an awesome experience. I was incredibly stressed. Of course. And uh, so out of that stress, I remember... And what is your normal life, you know, your day job looking like at this time? Yeah, so uh, great question. So at that time, um, my day job was... Uh, filming video and photography for um, a company that owned Hilton Head Rentals and Charleston Rentals and Dot Real Estate. And so my capacity for that company was in a few different ways, and uh, it was a lot of fun. Essentially, I would go to a lot of these nice homes on the water or different things like that and do photography, do uh, you know, a, a 60 to 90 second video of the home, kind of promo video to music. And then I was also creating different content for the real estate and the rental side to give context to what it would be like to rent a certain home or to live in an area. So I might do a video on the top five beaches in Hilton Head and kind of what each each beach provides. Or I might do a video on, uh, you know, the best restaurants on Hilton Head, you know, when you come visit, things like that. And so um, my boss, uh, and I'd, I'd been doing that for six months, so not very long. And my boss at the time, uh, we, we became pretty good friends. He was really chill. And um, so he really gave me the flexibility to, to work on a lot of this Murdoch stuff. And really, his, he kind of took off his boss hat and put on his friendship hat. And for a time was like, hey, Eric, uh, the extra videos that you do about, you know, top five this or what are the, the that, like, let's not worry about that stuff right now. When we need you to shoot a home, we'll have you shoot a home. But like, we're going to lower your workload a lot so that you can spend time on this YouTube stuff because I think there's something there. And I think you I might mean, be able to turn clear. that into if, something. If, if you're somebody in the audience who's gotten to this point and you're interested, go to Eric's channel, which is obviously linked below. Scroll to the first video and watch it and, and see what we're talking about here. But it's clear that there's something there. There, I mean, it's like... There's a lot of great bands who drop their first album, and it's absolutely amazing. It it's not something that if you have to work your way up to. So clearly, your boss saw that. Yeah, yeah, he did, um, which was awesome. And, and thank you for the encouragement. I, I definitely appreciate it. And so um, he gave me more time to work on it, which was massively helpful, um, and did reduce the stress some. Um, and so with that journey, um, kind of. Uh, Another thing that, that I did that I'll mention, especially since I'm, I'm here on, on Fitz, is I reached out and uh, talked with David Moses and was like, hey, man, uh, I don't know what I'm doing as far as, you know, sponsorships, potentially sponsorships or um, analytics or this and that. And so he actually grabbed coffee with me um, just like a couple weeks after my first video posted. And um, so that kind of started a little bit of a, a cool relationship with David and, and Mandy. And I consider them friends of mine now, which is which is cool. But um, so, uh, yeah, so dove in to episode two and approached that one a little bit differently. I decided to file the FOIA request and read, you know, every word of every document and watch every minute of every video that I could. And that was a really, really fun experience. And I think uh, my investigative side really kind of came out during that, which was a lot of fun. Um, Did you feel like at the beginning, you were like, who am I to even be doing this? Yes. Because when I started working here, like my first couple phone calls, if you don't know when you're preparing a news story on somebody or you usually give them a call to ask for comment. 
And the first couple times I did that, I would pick up the phone and like shakily dial the number, like oh, I'm dumb Dylan Nolan calling from Fitz News. You know, at this point, I, I know the facts of the case. I'm not going to ask somebody for comment unless I am 100% ready. But the first couple times you do something like that, it's pretty terrifying. Yeah, it's so true, and it, it's so true. There, there is definitely that. Like, who am I to be telling this story, or who am I to be even even researching this to present it? And honestly, I, I, I kind of mentioned this sentiment before we started, but there's a part of me that's like, who am I to be sitting down with Fitz News and these cameras and lights even right now? Like, why right. do people even want to talk to me or, or are interested in this stuff? And um, there's a little bit of that like imposter syndrome, I think, sometimes, um, which I, I think uh, if, if handled in a healthy way can be good. Uh, to, to keep egos down. Um, but obviously you don't want to let it get out of control, but, um, so yeah, there was, there was definitely some of that and there definitely still is. Um, but, uh, but I, I enjoy that. I, I enjoy being out of my comfort zone and I, I enjoy trying new things. And so it's, uh, yeah, it's been a wild adventure and to kind of like cap off the kind of like journey of how I got into the YouTube space. Um, a few months ago I started covering other cases and that was a really cool experience for me. The first video that I posted about a totally non-related case, I uh, went to Missouri for Christmas to visit some family there. And I took a day to drive over to Springfield, Missouri, and just film all day for a case that, that I'd, I'd started researching. And I remember being really nervous about posting that video because I wasn't sure if my success was completely due to the Murdoch story being such a a big story, or if people were interested in the Murdoch story and the way that I tell stories and research and present things. And so that video has a quarter million views right now. <laughs> um, and uh, I just posted another video on a completely unrelated case two weeks ago that has 210,000 views right now. So it's been really encouraging to see people are not just interested in the Murdoch case for me, but interested in the way that I present stories and research stories and um, you know, uh, tell the story with a sense of humanity, uh, in an engaging way. So, um, I'm, and it's funny you mentioned that yeah. because the Murdoch murders podcast took the same branch. And I don't think that they were really looking for another case so mm -hmm. much as the Bowen Turner story just mm -hmm. has so many parallels between the Murdoch family and, and the way that the miscarriage of justice in that yeah. case, quite frankly, yeah. it's just something that we knew that the, the Murdoch audience clearly felt yeah. the draw to because it yeah. shows that this is not a one-off case in South Carolina. Yeah. This is the way that the people that have power think that the judicial system should treat them. There's a trend. Right. And that and that's why that case was so good for them to bring in on the Murdoch Murders podcast yeah. because it, it shows that trend. It yeah. shows that this is a pattern. Yeah, for sure. And uh, I, I was interested to see how, um, because with the success of the Murdoch Murders podcast, there's just no way that that Mandy and David and Liz couldn't transition into doing another case. Like it, like they have to do other cases. And so I was interested to see how that transition was going to work, and they're doing it really well. Um, now I was also interested uh, from a, like a, a a YouTuber that thinks about analytics and titles and names and stuff like that. Um, the Murdoch Murders podcast was the perfect name at first for, uh, right. for, uh, search engine optimization and for branding. Um, but, uh, I'm interested to see how they transition, uh, when the Murdoch stuff is completely finished into having content that's outside of that. Um, but the other thing that you have to remember is that, you know, Mandy's had an extensive career as a journalist yeah. as, as, as Liz, you know, yeah. And they were doing great work for Fitz before the Murdoch murders. Yeah. I'm sure they intend to continue to do great work. Now, what will they do in the audio space and the video yeah. space? That remains to be seen. Yeah. But They've got the not, chops for it, for right, sure. It's not like they came onto the scene with the Murdochs. Mm -hmm. It's like yeah. this case just happened to be something that appealed to so many people throughout the world that mm -hmm. their work was highlighted. But yeah, you could go back and read a story that Mandy wrote two years ago about corruption at the school board level yeah. and it's inspiring yeah for sure who's covering the same school boards now yeah that she's primarily working on murdoch related stuff mm -hmm. I, I read her stories and i you know talk to the sources that she helps me get in touch with and you appreciate the quality of her journalism 
no matter what yeah. she's talking about. For sure. For sure. I completely agree. And, and honestly, when I said that, I, I kind of forgot that podcasts like are a little bit different in the sense that like uh, the creator creates a podcast and then that podcast kind of like lives on its own and then they create another podcast, you know? Mm-hmm. But the, the, the point that I was trying to make is like if I named my YouTube channel like the Murdoch film series – Right. And then wanted to cover other things on the Murdoch Film Series channel. Um, but I, I guess, yeah, I didn't even think about with podcasts. It's certainly been a conversation that it's, yeah. we, we've all had of like, so what happens? Because obviously mm-hmm. the Murdoch case is going to go on for a very long time. Yeah, it is. Murder charges have not been dropped yet. Yeah. We know that the feds are doing something, although they are very airtight as to, as to what they are doing. But there will be federal charges. I would bet anything on that. Yeah. So we'll see what they do. They could they could be bringing some pretty complex financial charges. Um, you know, I don't know if you watched the the TV show The Sopranos, but we have a lot of I predictions know. that they will be pressing the same type of charges that they pressed on Tony Soprano, which are called RICO charges. Throughout that whole show, they're always worried about the RICO this, the RICO that, yeah. which is like this ad- advanced way of prosecuting racketeering okay. and organized crime cases. Yeah. So, and obviously covering the craziness that will be whatever legal proceedings happen following murder charges, there's going to be a lot to cover in the Murdoch case. And we have a great researcher named Jen Wood. I don't know if you're familiar with her, but she is uncovering something ridiculous every week. And she has been doing that for uh, as long as I've known her. And there just seems to be no signs of it stopping. It's just that we see further connections. We see the spider web continues to extend out to bankers to other lawyers Mm -hmm. to law enforcement officials to judges and as people you know as a news outlet that's focused on that investigative side and and the justice system truly functioning even if it's not as sexy that that's years of rooting through that to make sure that these people are actually held to account yeah and that it's not just oh we've thrown alex in in the clink Mm -hmm. forget about it yeah, I think that's wildly important. And honestly, I think that's part of the reason that with my first episode, I reasoned to be able to put it out is that is that exposing and shedding a light on some of these injustices, I think can create a better world in the future. And uh, if I'm, it can't, then I'm going to find a new job. Right. That's, exactly. the, that's the thing that gets me out of bed and into work and chipper and happy to be here every morning. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's 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 a it's a sense of purpose, knowing that what you're doing is is hopefully creating a better world. And, you know, to, to, to go back into a little bit about this Murdoch case and how, you know, it's called the Murdoch case because that's one of the main players, but it's almost so much bigger than that when it comes down to law enforcement and it comes down to uh, connections and things like that. And I, I'm working on a, a separate case right now in South Carolina that I, I'm, I can't mention the name of at the moment. But um, there's some... There's some of that going on in this one as well. And I um, am finishing up a case in Georgia um, where the sheriff is just a good guy. And so it, it's cool to see. Well, I think it was really helpful for me to talk to the sheriff in Georgia because he has a passion for justice. Uh, when I interviewed him the second time, hearing him talk about um, the GBI, which is Georgia's version of SLED, mm-hmm. And the FBI, and he was like, dude, it's all a corrupt system. And this is a sheriff telling me it's all about connections and getting the right numbers and this and that. And he's like, I hate working with them because they just, uh, th- their hearts just aren't in the right place. And uh, seeing that stark contrast between that sheriff and the sheriff in the South Carolina case I'm working on at the moment uh, is, uh, is eye opening. It really is. And so, you know, I, I don't think all law enforcement is is bad by any means. I think there's some really good apples out there. It's a case-by-case case basis. It's a case-by-case case basis. Exactly. But diving in and dealing with multiple law enforcements has allowed me to see relatively clearly that some of them are uh, um, need to be exposed, I guess, for lack of a better, better word. Completely. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, the, the hope that through – telling the public these things that they need to know that we can inspire them or shame them or, you know, I don't say the members of the public need to be shamed, yeah. but shame the the people in power into yeah. effectuating meaningful change. For know? sure. That's, that's really, that's what, you know, you were talking about the fear of making entertainment about somebody's death, but 
And if you're just making entertainment about it, that's scummy. Yeah. It feels it feels wrong. Yeah. But if you're making a piece of content that in, is about somebody's death, but that inspires meaningful change that might prevent other people from suffering the same fate, that's when it, it becomes something that's really impactful and, and beneficial. I, I completely agree. And and kind of going back to um, the, the public, um, I think a lot of the public is just, and, and I, I was too, so I don't use this word in a defamatory sense by any means, but I think the public is just ignorant. That it's, it's impossible to know. You only have so many hours in a day and you already have a million things in your life that you have to be concerned about. You exactly. need somebody to slap you in the face with, with it or you're not going to care. Yeah, it, it's so true. It's so true. And, you know, I got slapped in the face from just diving into it all on right. accident almost. But right. um, it's, yeah, it's a, it, it, there's no blame for them being ignorant. Um, and again, I don't use that in a defamatory sense. I'm ignorant about a lot of things, but um, I shedding light on this stuff and informing the public, I think is incredibly valuable. I really do. Well, so. I look forward to seeing where you go. Thank um, you. Keep shedding the light. And thank yeah. you so much for coming in and speaking with us today. Yeah, it's been a blast. I appreciate it. Yeah, so if you guys want to check out any of my stuff, uh, you can just search Eric Allen on YouTube. I think there's a musician that has the same name, but I'm not the musician. Um, and I've got seven uh, episodes right now on the Murdoch series. I'm working on an eighth, and then I've got a couple other cases that I'm working on as well. So if you wanted to check it out and subscribe, I would really appreciate that. Um, but again, thank you so much for having me. Um, I really appreciate it. This was a lot of fun.